Um, I, was, I gave a talk at Oxford a, a couple of months ago, and, and I guess it can't have gone too badly because they let me back. Um, but I was, uh, I'm 24 now. I was at UCL um, in, uh, between 2007 and 2010. And I'll start off, I know we've only got sort of just under an hour to, to do a talk and a bit of Q&A. So I want to keep the Q&A bit quite big, so I'll kind of rush through um, kind of my experience, and then we'll go into talking about apps specifically. So um, I went to this school. Um, I was a bit of a bad boy at school. You can see my discipline record on the left-hand side. So I wasn't, I'm not the most academic of, per, of people. I like disruption. I like mucking around with people. Um, I, wa I wasn't very good at a lot of subjects, and you can see there's lots of silly behavior. That kind of sums up my, my, um, my attitude, my way of thinking. Um, and uh, so, but when I was at school, the one thing I really did enjoy, I, I, it was kind of the time where the internet was really taking off in terms of um, between the ages of when I was kind of nine and 15 was, was the, the dot-com boom. And um, I really enjoyed sort of seeing uh, learning about the web, and we had, it was the first time our school had like, this, this computer room and we could learn about like, programming and things like that. So even though it wasn't really a subject, and to be honest, as I'm sure um, it still is in schools, that computing isn't uh, at the forefront like maths or English is. But I really enjoyed that side of it. I liked um, going into a library and remote, remote shutting down somebody else's computer because it was fun. Um, and, uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, no, but it was, it was good. It got me into a lot of trouble one day because I hacked into the school's um, uh, database and got a teacher's phone number and gave it to a friend because he fancied her. And, uh, <laughs> and then when he got found out, he then dobbed me in. So um, I got suspended from school. But anyway, I made it through and I went to UCL um, and I joined a load of people like this because uh, <laughs> it was the only subject I was good at. It was computer science. It was computer, computer science. Anyone guess who these people are? Hands up. Yep. Yes, very good. It was Microsoft Bill Gates, uh, bottom left, as you can see. It's the founding team. Some of them didn't have heads. Um, <laughs> and I lived in a house like this. And I was um, in my third year. I kind of went through the whole of, um, of uni doing computer science. And I was in my third year. Um, I was very much on the route to going, as I'm sure some of you are thinking about going into, uh, I was going into investment banking. And I'd thought about looking at consultancy, investment banking. I'd also thought about doing a startup. But I thought, right, I'll go and do this for a few years, but um, uh, I'd go into investment banking for a few years and I'll see how it goes and I'll hopefully do a startup one day. Um, whilst I was uh, in my third year, it was just the beginning of the exam period, I came up with this like, sort of really crazy idea that um, I, it was almost based on a game that my friends and I played. It was, it was about sharing where fit people were in the library. <laughs> uh, and so overnight, in about 12 hours, I built this website. Um, I know we're talking about apps, but this is kind of uh, this was kind of before apps became mainstream, and uh, there's, a, there's a quite a good link later on where you'll find out. But I built this in about 12 hours. Um, it was about to share where hot people were in the library. So this was for guys, for girls, and I'm sure if many of you are students here, it goes on in all universities around the country. It's a, like a university dating platform. Um, but for me, it was just a, for me it was just a joke. Um, I just knocked the microphone off there. Um, for me, it was just a joke, and uh, I set it up. Um, built it overnight, and uh, at about 2 o'clock in the morning after having lots of Red Bull, fit, the fitfinder.co.uk was the only name that I could really think of. I put it live at 9 o'clock in the morning the next day, and I sent one link to a friend. And um, this Facebook was going pretty, like, pretty well at the universities, um, and so the, the best way to sort of get a message across was through Facebook. But I didn't want people to know it was me. It was kind of like I wanted to be like that kind of that silent executor that that did something, and it was a bit of a joke that, that sort of got around. Um, but I put it live, and I kind of forgot about it, because I went back to bed and, um, and just let it go. But this is kind of how the traffic went. And these are unique users in certain buckets. So at 9 AM, there wasn't a huge amount of people. But you can see 10 AM was a completely new, new loss. It's not cumulative. Um, it went pretty well, sort of got to 3 o'clock. And by 4 o'clock, um, the servers that I had it on um, were kind of failing. So it actually came down. And um, also, somebody had, uh, had, had, had kind of hacked it as well. So they're getting geeky now. But somebody had um, done what's called an SQL injection and had redirected the site. So if anybody had gone to it, they redirected it to Google Images tits. <laughs> so uh, I had to sort that out and, um, and came back. So that's a true story. Um, after doing, so this was just at UCL. So, so bear in mind that UCL has 20,000 students. In one day, in about six hours, I'd managed to get probably about a quarter of those Sorry, 10% of those um, on it. 
And, um, but it was get, the word was getting about, and the Guardian uh, very quickly wrote a blog about, about FitFinder, about like, sort of this idea about what students were really doing in, in universities. And um, so I, I, was, I was inundated by people from other universities trying to do the same thing. They were like, oh, I really want to do FitFinder at LSE or at King's or at Oxford or Cambridge. And so I basically said, here's a spreadsheet, fill it in with all your locations in your uni and we'll get it up. Um, I actually also had people cloning FitFinder. So somebody set up Hottie Finder in Nottingham and, um, and, and they tried to get traction. Although once, the, the sort of, once FitFinder had got um, a bit of traction, it was very difficult to kind of stop it, especially as I was kind of like just trying to roll it out across universities. Um, by this point, that my name had got out in terms of somebody had looked it up on the domain registry and worked out it was me. So I was kind of like, let's just see how far this could go. So um, days one to six kind of get, got more and more traction as we were adding more universities. By day five, I think we had seven universities um, up um, and one of them was LSE. And if any of you have been to the LSE library in London um, by the Strand, it's this massive library. I think it's about six floors. It's got this really nice sort of open area where you can see everybody. So it was kind of a, a perfect place for FitFinder to exist. And um, it was already doing pretty well, but not, maybe not everyone sort of knew about it until uh, the LSE administration decided that it wasn't too happy with, 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 with FitFinder and that it saw a load of students in their library sort of mucking about and it thought, right, the library's not there for mucking about, it's there for studying. So they very kindly sent out an email to all their students and staff. Um, I won't let you read it all, but the subject was thefitfinder.co.uk, um, <laughs> which is great. Just get your message across, get the call to action. Uh, they described what it did pretty succinctly. Um, that's, that's another sort of lesson in e e e sort of email marketing, is to get across your, your elevator pitch very um, succinctly. And the best bit of it was sort of give them a really good reason why they, why they shouldn't use it. Um, and that day I had uh, almost double the amount of traffic than, uh, that, than I ever had. Um, so it carried on going and it, just, it, was, it was just fun sort of seeing it grow. It had more and more universities. By day eight, um, it actually got blocked by the university networks, sort of, uh, sort of UK wide, because they're all managed by this one network provider called Janet. Well, they were back then. I don't know if it's changed. And, um, yeah, by, by day, day eight, LSE had kind of had a bit of a, an issue that they doubled our traffic and um, it had been going pretty well. And so they decided that they were going to pull some levers and try and get it blocked at, uh, uh, across the UK network. Um, so it was down for two days, but after a petition and, and uh, like e uh, newspapers writing about it, it got unblocked and we were on our way again. So it's just, we'll go this forward. Going to get RSI on my finger. By about this point, yeah, so by day 22, there was, it was getting a load of press in, um, there's the Churwell, so, oh no, that's not Churwell, there's Varsity, there's the Churwell, so it was in a lot of um, student-based press, and it was in the Times, and it, that kind of fueled it, so for, for FitFinder, press really did do, to do wonders for, for getting traction, um, no, keep going, and by kind of 36, 37 days after launch, um, all the way through, and kind of after the LSE incident, I was... Um, I'd been contacted by UCL. First one was kind of like a, uh, a, a tap on the wrist, saying like, you should probably take this down, but we can't force you to do anything about it. And by this point, I was one, the day 38 was actually my, the day of my, um, my final exam. And all the way through this, I had not really studied for my exam my, in my finals. And I was kind of like, I'm, not, I'm really not gonna dread getting these results. But day, on day 37, I was pretty much given a cease and desist saying, um, if you don't take this website down now, then we are going to, uh, you're going to go to a hearing and there's a chance you could lose your degree. And after three years and obviously spending a lot of money on universities and seeing as this was just a joke and I was not really making a huge amount of money out of it, um, I thought, I mean, it had gone too far and that I was going to take it down. So on day 38, I took it down. Um, that was also when the press like really jumped on it because um, it was in the tab, Metro, the Times written about it again, TechCrunch wrote about it. Because it was kind of like this Mark Zuckerberg story of what, what happened with him with, um, with FaceMash. Uh, BBC News, and then I went on Sky News to talk about it as well. Um, that's the one and only time I've ever worn makeup. So, uh, so yeah, it looked pretty good. Um, so, yeah, uh, that, that's kind of really where my life kind of... I was on this on a very, very set career path where I was going to go into investment banking. And I would probably remain there well past my age now, probably for another four or five years onwards. And then... 
um, who knows what would happen. But that's kind of where my, my career took a, a pivot. Um, and after that, I went and actually did the grad, the grad scheme. I, I did it for six months. Um, but I was getting very itchy, and I was speaking to a number of investors about potentially going and doing my own thing. Um, and I was put in a very nice position that after FitFinder, I'd kind of shown that I had um, some, some decent ideas that people might like um, and uh, wanted to go and build an app company. So um, the first idea, I raised uh, £100,000 of investment. Um, the first idea that I wanted to do was to pretty much do the same as FitFinder, but try and do it in the US and try and do it on mobile. Um, and so uh, I founded a company called Phlox. Um, we've pivoted slightly in terms of what we're doing now, but I'll, I'll go in to what we were doing at the start. So we were pretty much going to take FitFinder, put it on mobile, on iPhone, and then let people do it anywhere they want so they don't have to do it on campus and they don't have to, um, uh, they don't have to do it in the UK. And they can set it up wherever. It completely failed. Uh, the name wasn't as strong, if you think about it. Flocks doesn't really have the same kind of connotations as FitFinder. But when you're trying to do something like FitFinder in the US, actually both my, my angel investors were American, and my second angel investor was like, what does fit mean? <laughs> and I was like, why are you investing in this business when you have no idea what fit means? Um, he thought it was a gym search engine. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's still invested, so it's fine. Um, and, uh, but, but I knew that the future was going to be mobile. I, knew, I could see like, m like there was a very, people were building apps. Like the apps on the App Store weren't great. Foursquare, uh, Instagram by 2010 had only just launched, um, but it wasn't a big thing. But I could see that this was going to be a place that a lot of people could sort of make a lot of money and a lot of um, the way that people are sort of having business is going to change. So I knew I wanted to do an app business. I knew that's kind of the route that we wanted to go. So I wasn't put off by the way that the, the, the original idea failed, but I knew that there were plenty more ideas in the bag, and I just wanted to make it last as long as possible. So we ended up building, uh, I'll show you some of the apps that we have actually built in the last sort of two years. We've been going uh, just over two years now. Um, but some of the apps we've built, and some of them we've done in collaboration with clients. So we actually built an app called Spotted um, that was acquired by The Sun. Um, and the idea behind Spotted <laughs> was kind of like um, what Foursquare originally started to do. It was about sharing photos in a location. Now, obviously, Instagram has kind of won that space now. But we kind of got a, a decent amount of traction with Spotted. Um, the Sun really liked the idea of it, and they wanted to use it on the Olympics and events going forward. And the idea behind what they're trying to do now is allow anyone to be a paparazzi. Anyone has a smartphone nowadays. Um, if you see um, a celebrity doing coke in the back of a, a club or whatever, you can get a photo of them and make some money out of it. People have camera phones nowadays. And uh, this is an application that you can, you can use to send in your photos to the sun. Um, a bit of a fun game that's really popular with, uh, with school kids. I was doing a talk at Eton College. And uh, I went in there, and it was amazing how many of those guys were playing this game. Um, at, in our office, we, we like to do these things called hackathons, and we like to come up with weird ideas and just try and test ourselves to, to build them as quickly as possible. And this was an original idea where um, we wanted to learn about sort of the different revenue models in apps. But aside from that, we knew that there was this, this big data source there where the, uh, the app rankings in the App Store um, just changed every few minutes. We were really interested by this. So we basically took that data, we took the app rankings, we, put, we took um, the ratings of apps, and we took sort of uh, uh, supply and demand metrics from the app itself and turned that into a stock exchange. So you can go on there, you'll get, you, it's, a, it's a, only a game, so you're given $10,000 to begin with, um, and uh, you can buy and sell, you can trade mobile apps. Uh, an app will go up if, it, if, it becomes, if people are downloading it more, if it goes up in the charts, if it rates better, and if more people buy it, then its, it's stock price will go up. Um, what's really interesting about this, in the first week of when we had this, we had um, a 25% conversion rate. And actually, the last time I spoke here, I recognize a few, a, a some of you here. I probably told you about this, about some of the ones we were doing. But 25% conversion rate of somebody actually going on downloading it and then paying us money as an in-app purchase, either for more virtual money, so they were giving us 69p for another $10,000, uh, or actually playing, uh, paying to cheat. So you could pay to view your friend's stock. It's almost like insider trading. Um, <laughs> and lots of people like doing that. But we also like solving personal problems. And, and, and the people we meet have come to us, and they have problems. And we like to work on their ideas as well. So this um, app um, was probably one of the, the most satisfying apps we built last year. 
And it's a really good example of a problem that you can have and, and how you can solve it with apps. So you can't really tell a huge amount from it here. But if you go and either Google via, uh, which is what it's called, via running app, or um, if you search on the App Store and download it, I think it's actually on a discount at the moment. Um, the idea is basically, yes, there are running apps out there. There's Nike Plus, there's Map My Run, and whatever. But none of them act like a sat-nav. The guys that came to us and said, we've got this idea for an app, came to us and said, we've got this idea for an app where we can plot a route, and I can put my headphones in, and that's all I have to do. I can put the app in my pocket. I have no fiddling around with my sweaty hands or whatever. I can just run. Um, and so what, that's exactly what Via does. You can plot your route, uh, put, put it in your pocket, and it will give you turn-by-turn -turn directions. Um, and if you want to pay more, you can get the queen to give you turn-by-turn -turn directions. Um, and, uh, and, and that's a really good example of an app that has been pretty well built. It's a premium app. so. The revenue model is you pay up front, but you can also sort of do in-app purchases uh, in the next update um, where you can pay for more voices and things like that. But that app is uh, in the app, I don't know if you've seen the Sunday Times app 500. It's one of the apps there. It's the top 10 apps of Guardian last year. So we're pretty, pretty nice and fun to work on that. But I'm sure that most of you, the reason why you've chosen to come to this talk instead of some of the others is because you're interested in developing an app yourself or you've got an idea or you want to know how you can sort of put that into one of your businesses. It, so how you can integrate an app into your business. So I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of the different kind of categories. And I know this, probably some of you are pretty familiar with these. But there are different nuances and things that I wish I'd known before I started about some of these. So games. Games is a huge money-making opportunity, but it's very, very uh, luck-oriented. If you look at something like Rovio with Angry Birds, I think Rovio, Angry Birds was something like their 40th or 50th game before they actually hit upon it. The amount of money, the amount of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears that they'd put into it before they were actually able to get a return on their investment. And yes, they've got a huge return now because they've turned it into merchandising. But for every Rovio, there is another nine that haven't made it. Um, so it's one of those things that, yes, you can have good ideas, but there's just so much competition. There's so much money in games <coughs> nowadays that it's a very difficult one to do. That's not to say you can't do it, though. Um, utilities. Utilities are one of my favorite um, sort of categories because you can actually solve some pretty cool problems. City Mapper, has anyone got this on their phone? Yeah, so City Mapper is a, um, one of those things is like, how can I get from here to here in the quickest possible time and give me the options that I can get here. So City Mapper is, is purely for London. So if you ever go to London, download it. Um, it will give you options to walk, uh, it'll tell you how many calories you're gonna burn, it can tell you which buses to get, how much it's gonna cost you, the tube, the taxi, uh, even helicopter. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's just a cool, cool, cool problem, but it's about solving a, a, a specific situation. Um, entertainment, I mean, we've all seen the fart apps, but these are kind of typically um, monetized either through sort of one-off payments like premium purchases or in-app purchases, um, or they're just kind of fads that people hope to, to download. I've got a friend that kind of specializes in doing these apps. He's got one app called Fit or Fugly. Um, I won't, I'll let you download that to see what that's about. And another app called Rackster. Um, I can't believe I'm endorsing these. I'm not. Uh, and he, he simply makes, he makes decent um, income just by himself by pushing those apps out. And people download them just for a bit of a joke and they actually, um, they're a bit fun. Um, productivity. So Wunderlist is a, a really cool to-do list that I use. I mean, I, I, I don't know what I'd do without this, this piece of software, but it's about you can see how, for them, mobile has been really important because it's enabled them to do cross-platform. They have it on, it's ubiquitous. It's what's called ubiquitous because I can go on my laptop and I can add a to-do on there, and as soon as I pick up my phone, it's already on there. It's been synced by the cloud. Um, productivity is a pretty sort of big industry. Um, Location-based, Foursquare kind of killing this, um, but still having that problem where what is going on around me? Like, what can I find to do around me? Who is around me? You see things like highlights, sonar, that are kind of built off Foursquare. Um, and Foursquare is uh, sort of doing pretty well, but like, no one's kind of won this game yet. And these guys are burning a huge amount of cash and haven't got a really big return on their investment yet. Social, I mean, tweet, tweet bot. Um, these guys, uh, Tapbots, are a, a company of two developers, I think. They're quite small. But they're making a lot of money out of just building really, really quality software products. So if you can be, they're not the first, uh, Twitter client, but they are probably one of the best Twitter clients just because of its slickness. Um, and like to give you one example, if you think apps are just the cheap apps, like I think Tweetbot, mm, when I bought it, was like four pound ninety nine. Uh, on on the Mac um, app that you can download, it's fifteen quid. 
So it's kind of like they're charging a huge premium, but they know they can charge that um, because they, they built quality software. Um, things like TweetDeck, TweetDeck, who was founded by Ian Dodsworth, is one of like the London's um, success stories because it was a, a London-based startup. They got acquired by Twitter a few years ago. Um, so yeah, there's still, there's still a lot of stuff you can do in terms of social apps. But if you've got an idea, how do you go about it? Um, what I like to do, especially, and this isn't with many things in, 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 kind of, um, in building apps, there are different approaches. And, um, but one of the first things that I like to do when I come up with an idea or an app is really think about it and get it on the whiteboard. Or in this case, this is down my co-founder at Phlox. We were in a hotel one day and we didn't have a whiteboard, so we were using the mirror uh, in the hotel room. But really kind of plan out exactly uh, the workings of, of, of what you're actually trying to achieve here. Is it an app that is going to solve a big problem in your life? Is it actually solve it? Are you trying to um, fix something that's wrong? Are you just trying to create an entertainment app? Is it something that you're just looking for high engagement that people are going to use um, so on a daily basis for a bit of fun, almost like a time waster? Or is it one of those apps that is, has a very short life, life, um, lifetime, like an app for the Rugby World Cup or an app for the Olympics that you know is only going to be used for a couple of weeks, but it's going to ha that, that's kind of what it's designed to do? But I urge you to put this on a whiteboard because it, it, it still means you can rub it out and nothing's permanent and it kind of gives you that kind of flexibility that it doesn't make you so rigid. Once you kind of got to that stage, I always find putting stuff on wireframes and I spend a lot of my time wireframing stuff out. There's a really cool tool called Balsamic, um, spelt like the vinegar, Balsamic, but with a Q on the end instead of a C. Um, and my laptop is just full of wireframes, they're just different ideas. And the best thing about this is you don't need to be a designer, you don't need to be a developer to put these together. Um, but they are really, really important if you are trying to get a developer or a designer to get across your idea in terms of what you want. And that's exactly what I do day to day, is just get ideas on paper and, and get other people to help me build them. Once you've wireframed something out, putting something into design, um, these were done by one of our designers at Flocks, but it's for a, a game that we were building for uh, one, of the, one of the clients we work with. Um, but really mapping out, it's almost like a complete user flow. It means that you don't forget about anything. Um, and really sort of thinking about the different um, flows of the game, where you're going to have things like, oh, I've got a mouse here, there you go, laser. Where you're going to have things like uh, pop-ups and stuff come in, because an app You've got to remember, you only have a very, very, very small amount of real estate. And compared to an well, on iPhone anyway and Android, but when compared to the, a website, for example, you've really got to sort of maximize what you're going to get out of that real estate um, and the screen size and make sure that only what is important is shown. <coughs> Coding it up is obviously the next step. And there are different things you can do here. Um, I'm sure a number of you have thought about going and, and you've probably Googled about how do you build an app or whatever. There are three main approaches. There is doing it natively. So natively is building it specifically for iPhone or Android or BlackBerry. Um, and that means you have to find a developer that can program in the exact language that, is, that those platforms are built in. So for iPhone, it's Objective-C. For Android, it's Java. For BlackBerry, it's Java. Uh, for Windows Phone, I think it's Java as well. Uh, but it's actually building it specifically for that device. Um, the apps that you'll see that will do this are like Halo, Foursquare is completely native, and they tend to be the nicer built, nicer built apps. They're the apps that are kind of purely designed for that device. Um, they're making sure that they're as slick as possible. The only problem is, if you want to build an app that is on many devices, you have to basically pay for a developer to build it two or three times, which can be very expensive, which is why I often don't recommend to, to try and build many apps at once. Concentrate on one platform and then do it over. Second way you can build an app is using something like AppCelerator or PhoneGap, which is like a write once and build to many um, platform. So that is where you write code in one language and the, it goes into this black box and it ports it to the different individual languages. That's getting better. I still would say the technology behind that is it's good for prototyping stuff and it's good for getting, um, getting it out early and trying to work stuff on it. Um, and it's cheaper. And if you know JavaScript, then you can potentially put something together on, on all those platforms um, at once. But the technology behind that is, is still not up there compared to doing it natively. But it is cheaper. The third option is uh, HTML5. Um, HTML5, again, is um, getting better. Um, you can see Facebook. Facebook's app used to have a lot of HTML5 in. They went back to doing it natively. 
Um, but I think they probably will go to HTML5 again. Um, what that means is that you can, you can pull in a lot of the web technology that you've already built into an app, and it means you can update stuff easier. Um, you don't have to go through the App Store, which we'll go on to, the, to a in, in a minute, um, and you can actually have a lot more, um, a lot more control over your app rather than putting it through there. Um, testing. I can't, like, this is one of the things that you get taught in CS. If, I did computer science at uni, but if you, um, the App Store and putting something through the App Store is so ratings based, it's so important to get a good quality product out there. Um, and so I, I agree that you need to have, you want to ship something as quickly as possible and you want to really get it out there, but that's, no, that's not to say you can't ship something quickly and then test it, fix it, ship it, test it, fix it, ship it, test it. Um, and so I put the picture of a runner up there because that running app that you saw earlier via, about 75% of, or I think even more than that, of the development time on via was spent testing it. Our developers actually came into the office in gym kit, uh, ended up spending half the day running and then coming back fixing bugs, running and then coming back and fixing bugs. So testing is really important. Like y you don't want users to get pissed that your app breaks, um, leave you really bad reviews because reviews are really important because if somebody, if you're going, I'm sure we've all done this, you've seen an app, it, you think it's like quite pricey, you go down the reviews, you see some people complaining and then you leave it. Have we all done that? So it's really important to test and make sure that works. Um, submission, and this is where it's slightly different between Android and, and uh, iPhone, is um, I'm only going to concentrate on those two because they're, at the moment, they're the two big players. Um, yes, I could talk about BlackBerry and I could talk about Windows Phone 7, but, but this covers the majority of the market. So with submission, um, iPhone are very, still very draconian about what goes on on the App Store. So I, AppDAC, for example, took, I think, six months to get on the App Store because we had to go, it got rejected three times, we had to change things. Um, and if you look at their terms of, like their, their policy when it comes to what apps are allowed on the App Store, it's just so woolly that you can't really predict whether something's gonna get blocked or not. But essentially they can stop something going on the App Store if they want, uh, because for any reason. And there have been cases where um, they've rejected an app and then released an app pretty much the same by themselves a few months later. Um, so it's, it's a little bit dodgy. But, um, there is a review process, and you should typically allow probably two or three weeks um, to, to, to before you can actually get your app out there. Um, Android is slightly better. You can you can normally get an Android app out in 24 hours time, um, and the review is is a lot the review process is a lot less strict. And then a lot of people forget about this. So as a developer, you get your app out there, but then there are hundreds and thousands of many other apps on the App Store. So you need to make how do you make a difference about what you're doing? And this all comes down to kind of what kind of market you're trying to attack. So if you're looking at games, how do you get game developers, um, how do you get game players to, uh, to download your app? And you look at things like Facebook ads are now appearing in, in, in Facebook mobile. And I'm sure a lot of the Facebook mobile ads that you've seen are game oriented. So game developers are paying probably between one and three dollars per download for your download there. Um, there are other download networks that you can go through. But um, a really good example of how uh, an, uh, you've got a very high-tech product, you can market it in a very low-tech way. We, we built an app um, that shows parking bays for motorcycles in London. The best way to market that to people was to flyer and go around other people's mopeds and put a flyer on their moped and tell them to download the app. Um, one of my favorite apps, Halo, um, which I use in London all the time, they, did, they, did, they had to market to two sides. Um, they had to market to taxi drivers. Um, just to give you an idea of this app, so this is an app that you can basically hail a cab uh, using your mobile phone. If you haven't already used it, if you're going to London, uh, download it as an awesome app. Um, but the way what they had to do, they had to market to two sides of the market. They had to get taxi drivers on board and they had to get passengers um, to be downloading and using it. So with passengers, they did tube advertising. They knew that their market was in London. They knew that their market were probably the people that were going to work and may potentially went out afterwards and they wanted a taxi. So they put a load of ads on tubes. Um, the way they marketed to cab drivers to, was to actually go and get biz dev people, business development people, to go outside the, 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 learn, the, the, um, the, the, the cabbie school where they learned to do the knowledge and basically sell it into them. And they actually had some founders, three of their founders are cabbies. So they had that kind of link, and the, the, the taxi driver community in London is very tightly knit. Um, 
And so that was kind of the best way they, get, they could get it in there. And as uh, if any of you went to Simon Devonshire and Raj Day's talk uh, earlier on, as Simon said here, like there's lots of people doing the same kind of thing here. You've got Get Taxi, you've got Uber, but Halo are kind of winning the London market because they've managed to sort of get the best product and they've, their marketing has really sort of uh, has got them into the pole position place. Um, another one of my favorite apps, which I've only just started using last week, but this is a really good example of how you can use an app alongside another piece of technology um, to, uh, to, to really sort of build a decent product. So Jawbone is a product that you wear on your wrist. It's a little uh, wristband that's got a load of sensors in electronics and it tracks your movement and it tracks your sleep. So you can put it into sleep mode and it will tell you a load of stats. And if you're a geek like me, um, you love metrics. And um, before the end, I'd, I'd go into a bit of like what I think is important about running a startup. But one of them is metrics. And I kind of, my life, I kind of run by metrics. So I like to know how much sleep I've got. I like to know how many times I wake up in the night. But these guys, um, and, the, and the kind of, um, I didn't, I, that, that list earlier wasn't an exhaustive list of all the categories. But another one is, is kind of healthcare apps. And people more and more are wanting to take care of themselves, uh, wanting to measure kind of what they're doing. Um, you can even have like urine tests now where you can <coughs> pee into a bag and plug it into your phone and it will analyze it. Um, uh, you can take payments. Square and Square are absolutely killing the payment space in the US um, by, by, by allowing somebody to take a credit card payment um, by plugging in a, a jack into their phone and, and taking a swipe. So it's amazing how you can use a mobile phone that is completely blank um, and, and have an app on it and, and use the data from a physical device that you've got on your wrist um, to actually turn that into a business. Um, what I'll finish up on is kind of, and this is sort of less oriented to apps, but from my experience of kind of doing startups for a few years, what I think is the most important things. So this is more general startup advice, but um, I think it's well, pretty well subscribed to in terms of uh, the, the, the comments that I'm going to make. So one of the most important things I think you need to do right from the beginning is, is get people on board. And you're not going to be able to pay people £100,000 uh, to join your startup when you, start, when you first begin. And so if you've got an idea, and this is when you're a founder, the most important job you have is selling it to your team. So selling the vision, selling, selling kind of the reason why they should join your startup instead of doing something themselves, or by going and doing something else for somebody else, or going to work for a bank. Um, having the best people on, on board will be pretty much the deciding factor as to, to how well you do. Um, you look at Halo, they decided they wanted six co-founders and they knew that they needed uh, three or two or three founders that were cab drivers. So that's why you've got people like Russell, uh, Russell Hall, who's one of their co-founders, that he, he, all, pretty much his job is to go around and get cabbies to sign up. Like, that was his main job at the very beginning, is to get that traction. Um, and if you're worried about like, kind of splitting, splitting equity and you're like, well, I have to give if I have six co-founders, then I'm only going to get, what, 16.6% each or whatever. Um, don't be, because at the end of the day, you'd rather have 16% of something that's massive than 100% of, of a failure, right? Um, but what is important is that you, you pick the right people. You don't want to pick people that at the end of the line you're going to fall out with, um, you're not going get, to get on with. Um, it's a big risk and it's a tough journey running a startup, so you want to be doing it with the right people. Um, a, a lot of people get confused about this part of it because you see people like Richard Branson on Twitter going around having fun on his island or whatever. For 99.9% .9 of entrepreneurs, it's not like that. It's like that. It's where you're absolutely exhausted. Um, you're working sort of 20 hours a day um, trying, to, to, trying to get your product off the ground, trying to get your business off the ground. And like, there's, no, there's no point hiding the fact that when you do a startup, you're taking one of the most um, not life risky uh, decisions in, in, the, in the world, i.e. you're not probably going to get killed off it, like if you're a fireman or something like that, but it's in terms of like job security, it's really not a great decision to make. Like if you're, if you're wanting to, to, to over, over your period of your career get rich, then percentage chances are it's not the best decision, uh, not the best career path to go down because it's a long, hard journey and, and the percentages, the statistics just say it's not going to work out. But if you are the sort of person that that, that wants to do something, wants to change the world, you feel there's a problem out there that actually you want to go and fix, and, um, and you actually will enjoy doing it, 
then um, that's, that's, that's the reason why you should be doing it. And a lot of people choose the wrong reason for it. Like the reason why I like doing what I do is because I enjoy it. I'd much rather be out meeting customers, um, running a team, working with people, building apps, seeing people use my apps, um, than actually uh, sitting behind a desk all day long. One of the most satisfying um, parts of my career so far wasn't when um, we signed a hundred thousand pound contract with a with a client. It was when I saw somebody on a bus using one of our apps. Um, so you've got to do it for the right reasons, and, and enjoyment is a big part of that. Um, measure and pivot. As I said, I'm wearing this wristband because I like to measure stuff in my life and kind of obsessed with it. But measuring and, and using the metrics available to you is absolutely important. And with apps, it's, n it's exactly the same as, as doing it on web. Um, there's, there's metric um, facilities like Flurry, where you can put Flurry into your app, and it will act like Google <coughs> Analytics. It will tell you how many people are using your app, how many sessions people are using your app, how often they're opening it, when they're opening it, what kind of person they are when they open it. Um, it's a great little tool that you can put in. And uh, exactly the same as web, you want to work out uh, where, the, where the pinch points are in your app. So if somebody's opening your app, they look at it and they don't sign in, why didn't they sign in? If you feel there's a big um, sort of big, uh, high level of friction at that point, you've got to do something about it. So a good example is we built um, AppDAC um, with Facebook login. And we noticed in the very first week that people opened the app, they saw Facebook login, and they turned it straight off. And they never, they never logged in with Facebook. They didn't really know what was going on. So we wanted to entice them in a little bit more. So we put a simple button that allowed them to view the market to basically get an idea about the, what the app was about and get them excited about it. So it was to, to cause them a trigger to then go and do Facebook login. And that increased sign-ups by 66%. So it's all about doing stuff like that. And you could even go a step sort of a bit more micro detailed and go, right, we're just going to change the text on that button. And this is something called A-B testing. So you can do this in apps as well. But instead of saying sign up with Facebook, let's put Facebook login and see how, how much difference that makes. And you can always run tests and, and, and work it out. Um, but this is when you, you go on a website like Amazon and you don't realize how optimized Amazon is. They know they, they're running A-B tests all day long. They, they even ran price tests for a while until people got pissed, up, pissed off about it. So if you logged on from London, um, they, would, they did at a time. They used to give you a more expensive price than somebody that logged on in Scotland. And they just basically saw, they wanted to test out what price they could charge um, until people started figuring that out and they got a bit annoyed. Um, build a network. I mean, this has been said so much before, but like, the people that you'll meet today and in Oxford are some really great, like, sort of bright guys and you'll all go on to do like, amazing things. You'll want to refer back to, to people you've met because if you don't know somebody that can do something, you'll know somebody that will know somebody that can do something. Like the, the, the concept of seven degrees of separation is just like, it's such a huge one. And using something like LinkedIn, which um, Reid Hoffman founded, um, is, is such a powerful tool that you can find so many people on, on, on LinkedIn. And at the end of the day, a business is a, is a people thing. And, and it's so important to sort of try and find the right skills. And if, if you're finding it tough to find people, then it's all about sort of getting, getting your message across about, about why you want to find somebody. Um, and LinkedIn is a great resource for that. And the reason why I've got the PayPal Mafia up here is because this PayPal have gone on. For, after the founding team of PayPal, so you've got Max Levchin here, um, and uh, each, each one of the, the PayPal mafia have kind of gone on to do great things in themselves. So um, did anyone see the SpaceX thing last night? Yeah, so um, uh, the, the founder of uh, SpaceX question, anyone know who that is? Elon Musk. Very good. Um, Elon Musk also founded Tesla. So it's amazing seeing how they've led, he's probably leveraged the network from the guys he met as PayPal who were also the founders of YouTube, um, the founders of LinkedIn. Um, they've gone on to do many, many things, but th it's, it's a very important thing to build your network and, and, and know who, can, so who you can pull in a favor with and also offer favors for, because there's lots of times where people come to me and ask me for a favor, and I say, yeah, I'll help them out, because I know in the future that I might need a favor back. Um, and life is a favors game, um, and sometimes you won't get back as many favors as you do, but in, in all odds, it's kind of a, it's a good, good game to play. Um, and the biggest thing, except for kind of measuring and pivot, is, is probably hustle, right? Um, does anyone recognize this box of cereal? 
No? Not a huge amount, yes. Okay, so this is a great little story from uh, a company called Airbnb. Who, has anyone been, used, heard of Airbnb? Anyone used them? So Airbnb is basically um, a website that allows you to rent out your apartment or your house or your airbed um, or, your, or your garage or your garden shed uh, or lets you stay at one of those if you're going to visit uh, a friend or whatever. But it saves you having to pay for a hotel if you don't, if you don't want to spend or you can't afford a hotel. Um, and you're probably thinking, well, what does it have to do with cereal? When the guys at Airbnb were trying to get going, they found it very, very difficult. Um, they were concentrating on political conferences, trying to think, right, if a, um, I think it was the Democratic conference in, in the US, if they, all, if they had one of those at a big a city, pretty much all the hotels were booked out. So they built this website around that case, that use case of if a, if a, if a political conference goes to a city and books out all the hotel rooms, they can, these, these guys can use Airbnb to basically um, uh, to find somewhere to stay. But they ran out of money, and they needed money very, very quickly. So instead of concentrating on getting their website out, they knew they needed to make changes to their website, but they were kind of like, we need 25 grand quick. So they started selling cereal boxes, branded cereal boxes like this, as like jokes. And they started selling them at $4 a pop. Um, and they sold out. All they were literally doing was printing these boxes going down the supermarket and, and taking the, the, the cereal out of, uh, out of their boxes and putting it in theirs. And they were selling them as like sort of uh, as joke items. And, um, and, towards, and towards the end, they, were thought they sold out of $4 a, a, a box. And they wondered how much they could put them up to. People were buying these at $40 a box. And in the end, they made $25,000, which kind of got them through to what, they, what they're doing. I think after that, they joined Y Combinator. And now it's a sort of a $1.8 billion company, right? Um, they're doing like, so, so well. They've got thousands of people staying at Airbnb places per night. But it showed that they could have e easily given up, but they were, they were convinced that they were onto something, and they hustled their way to, um, to get where they were going. Um, I know you probably, some of you probably read these books, but, and I, I put these books up at every talk I do because these are, I'm not a big reader, but these are books that have kind of helped me um, in the last two or three years. The, very one, the one on the far left is probably one you've all heard of, uh, The Lean Startup. It's just a good, a good basic read in terms of running a startup, using metrics and things like that, doing the lean, uh, doing like building MVPs. The middle one, Venture Deals, um, is a good book when you're raising in investment. And um, I can take questions on raising investment and what I think is tough about that. Um, but Venture Deals is kind of gives you the... Uh, a really good insight in terms of um, what's standard on a term sheet, what you should really look for in the legals. Um, and a lot of people, when they're going, a lot of entrepreneurs, when they go through in the investment stage, they'll have lawyers. And I recommend you get a lawyer, but you still need to understand the legal terms and sort of get that across. And the one on the right is The Dip, which by a very famous author, Seth Godin, um, who uh, is great because it's only about 60 pages long. Um, you can read it in the evening, but it, it kind of, it will, it will, it will, it will talk through exactly what every entrepreneur will go through at some stage. It's about that point where you don't know whether you should give up or not. And giving up is not, not, the, not a, a bad thing. It's about giving up at the right time and knowing when to give up and knowing when to pivot. So do you give something up or do you just change what you're doing? Um, and this is a really good book to read when, uh, uh, when, when you're kind of trying to make those decisions. Um, that's my email address. I'd happily take... Uh, uh, any questions on email, but we'll open up to the floor and I'll take questions now. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Great presentation. Um, I have a question regarding marketing. If you develop an app, um, do you have any specific um, advice on how best to market it? I think it depends on what app you're marketing. Um, as I said, the Halo, the Halo guys went with tube adverts. Um, and I was sitting on a tube yesterday and I saw one of my friend's adverts. And it, it's amazing, like, it depends on really kind of who you're trying to attract. And what is important is trying to work out your CPA, your cost per acquisition, your use acquisition. Um, and you try and work that out by saying, if I have a user that downloads my app, how much am I willing to pay for them to get on my app versus how much can I make out of them? So I was at the London Web Summit yesterday, uh, which is a big uh, tech conference in London. 
and Uber, who do a very similar thing to Halo, were giving out um, vouchers basically saying, here's £20 free credit. So that's a form of marketing. I was given a voucher for £20 free credit where they're going to have to pay £20 to use to, for me to use that service. But they know that the user acquisition point is 20 quid because I've also seen them do a form of marketing where I can actually invite you to Uber and if you sign up, you get £10 and I get £10. So the cost of getting you to sign up is still 20 quid to them, but they've kind of worked that out at that number. Um, but they, they are taking a bet on the fact that once you're signed up, uh, you are going to use the service that they make that 20 quid back. And the amount that I've used Uber and the amount that probably the people I've invited to use Uber, they've made that, that money back. And looking at their growth curve, uh, growth curve, that's kind of what they're doing. But it really depends on, on what kind of app you're doing. Um, you look at... Uh, it's, it, the, the advertising market in apps is really immature still. You look at how Facebook is trying to um, monetize their mobile site. Like they had a, a very difficult time um, monetizing their app with ads. And the, the biggest problem is they don't have the real estate, right? If you're, if you're, if you're trying to, um, I mean, Facebook's business model was all about, a lot of their ads were e-commerce ads, right? So on the right-hand side, it was all about uh, buying shoes, buying trainers, if I liked Nike or whatever, and I could click on it. And then I'd go to a website where I could buy trainers. So there was a very clear conversion. But who buys trainers on apps, right? If you down, on, on mobile, if you download, if you're on Facebook, you see an advert for trainers, the friction of trying to put your credit card details into a website to buy trainers is just so high. So advertisers weren't big fans of mobile. But now Facebook's doing uh, mobile advertising. And you see a lot of the stuff that they're advertising is apps. Um, so I'd, I'd have a look at doing Facebook ads. Um, you could even look at cross-promoting with other ads, so ad networks like uh, iAds uh, or uh, AdMobby and things like that, or Flurry even do an ad network where when you open up somebody else's app, you can get an advert in there and it will, it will take you straight to download it. Yep. Um, are you at all concerned that the recent growth in app apps um, has any parallels in the dot-com boom? I don't think so. I mean, if you look at the, the dot-com boom, it was a lot of um, huge valuations were being made off um, websites that weren't very profitable and, and almost didn't show that. You look at boo.com, um, how they were just burning cash, right? Whereas you look at ads, and you could say with Instagram, right? They had huge user base, but they weren't making any money. Um, but it depends what game you're trying to play. Like Facebook paid a billion dollars for them, but those, the value that Facebook can see in Instagram is huge. Um, because they get a, a load of users that weren't using Facebook camera, the camera app to use it, and they can, can acquire those. Um, but the biggest thing is that these apps are actually making a lot of money, right? You look at how much money Halo's using, Uber's using. Um, I think Foursquare is an outright example of an app that you could probably look at that and say, that's, that's not typical, that's, that's probably the, the side you're, you're thinking of, where an app has received a huge load of investment but what value are they actually creating? Um, but I'm not, I'm not terribly worried, just because um, you look at the, the adoption of mobile apps and what people are spending money on them, and that's, it's the way it's going, it's the way it's going. Yeah. Um, I wonder if it may be a slightly personal question. Sure. Sure, yeah. So um, the, the, the main vision to begin with was um, we were going to build a company that was trying to make money um, and trying to fund ourselves purely off the development of building our own apps and monetizing them either through premium, um, uh, premium sales, so that's selling an app for 69p or £1.29, uh, or doing an in-app purchase, so it's doing like free apps and then uh, getting money through through an in-app purchase, or doing advertising. And after we did the original Flocks app and we did Spotted, what we found was very difficult is the, the lead time of doing this was, was huge. So to try and get a winner um, of trying to find an app that you found could actually um, build up enough revenue to fund a team of, say, 10 developers was going to take too long. So that's why we started to do a lot of like, client work with other people. So the, um, we did this deal with The Sun where they were going to acquire uh, our app Spotted. So Spotted had, had a bit of traction, but it wasn't enough. So we kind of, the strategy there was we'll sell it to the Sun and then we'll help them maintain it and help them build it up. And we'll work on a contract like that. Because at the end of the day, we, we, were, we are still a startup. We still need funds from somewhere. Um, 
now, at this point in time, I would say 20% of our uh, revenue is from um, apps themselves. So doing things like via app, you know, that running app, uh, looking at apps like AppDAC, um, actually sales from apps. And the rest of the funds is through working with other companies like The Sun, uh, The Times, and building, helping them build apps, things like that. But the growth, in terms of like seeing the change of that, the, the app revenue side has got bigger. I think probably, probably doubled each year, so it's getting bigger. Um, okay, so yeah, no worries. I, I can give you the app, the app revenue side. The client side is slightly more difficult to give you another one. So the app revenue side last year. So for example, um, AppDAC uh, this the, the end of 2012. So it only launched like in the middle of last year to the end of this year. I think made 25,000 pounds after Apple's cut, um, and that was so we typically make probably about. Um, that was probably about half, just under half of our total revenue from the app side. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. So do you also work with more clients? Uh -huh. Like not just kind of client clients. We do, yeah. So I mean, that, that's one of the ways that we help fund ourselves because we always wanted to work on our own apps. But the app market itself, in terms of the stuff that we found, is you've got to get to a certain point. Kind of like Rovio, like one of our apps might take off, but we just need to get to that point. So it might be the 50th app, it might be the 52nd app, it might be the 17th app, right? Um, so by working with other people, firstly, we've been able to pick up a load of expertise that we didn't think we would be able to. Um, and also, we can work on great projects. So for example, Via, these guys raised investment. We, we invested in it as well, but we also got paid to build the app. So it was kind of like a, it was a good deal for everyone. And then when you get sales like Via's getting, um, it works pretty well. Say, for example, if I have a good app idea, mm -hmm. can I come to you? Yeah, you could come to me, and we could say, yeah, we, yeah. You, could, you could come to me either saying, right, we raised investment, but I don't want to hire a team. Because this is the thing, when you're building an app, you might raise investment, but you don't want to hire a team or have the skills to actually go and do it. Or you might say, come to me and say, do you like my idea? Do you want to build it and have an equity stake in it? We've done that a lot with other stuff last year. Okay, so in case you don't like my idea. Yeah. I'm sure it's a very good idea. <laughs> Say it's a crap idea. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'm not kind of known how to build that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what do you think I should do to try to build the app myself? Yourself. Is there anything doable? Is there um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's people that are, or make friends with an iPhone developer to begin with. Um, I think it's the, this is the main question I always get asked is, if you're not a technical person, if you're not a developer, how do I get my app built? And um, it's the same as that last slide. You've got to hustle. You've got to find somebody that can help you do it. So go to a developer and say, right, uh, like, uh, what, what are you doing? Are you a freelancer at the moment? What do you think of my idea? And almost think of him like an investor. You've got to sell him your vision and say, right, this is what I'm really good at, but I'm missing the part about building the iPhone app. I've got a great idea. I've, I can do the business -like side of it. Um, will you co-found this with me? If you don't think they're co-founder material, then suggest another option where you basically say, um, you help me build it. I will give you options in it. It's a hard sell because programmers and developers know that they're in demand. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have to find it some way. The, the opposing side of that is you can go and build, uh, sell boxes of cereal uh, for $25,000 yeah. and then hire an iPhone developer. So even worst case scenario, yeah. I don't find any developer, okay. any money, anything yeah. at all. Can I learn myself, do you think? You can. Oh. Yeah, no, there's no, no reason you can't learn, learn, learn yourself anyway. But if, you, like, if you're going down that route, you can go on something like Code Academy, teach yourself to code JavaScript or whatever, and then go and learn how to do it, like the stuff on App Accelerator. And you could potentially build a minimum viable product mm -hmm. through learning JavaScript and then building an app through that. So your best advice there is to go to Code Academy? I think going, going to Code Academy, there's um, uh, General Assembly, which is a, like, in London, they do courses and things like that. Yeah. But in my experience, Gen uh, Code Academy is like a really nice way to learn to code. Yeah. Okay. Yep, I think you had your hand up for a while. Yeah.